Hello, and welcome to Father Patrick Can Read, with me, Father Patrick, as we continue our adventure in Narnia by reading Chapter 5 of Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis. Chapter 5. Caspian's Adventure in the Mountains. After this, Caspian and his tutor had many more secret conversations on the top of the Great Tower, and at each conversation, Caspian learned more about old Narnia, so that thinking and dreaming about the old days and longing that they might come back filled nearly all his spare hours. But of course, he had not many hours to spare, for now his education was beginning in earnest. He learned sword fighting and riding, swimming and diving, how to shoot with the bow and play on the recorder and the therabo, how to hunt the stag and cut him up when he was dead, besides cosmography, rhetoric, heraldry, versification, and, of course, history, with a little law, physic, alchemy, and astronomy. Of magic, he learned only the theory, for Dr. Cornelius said the practical part was not a proper study for princes. And I myself, he added, am only a very imperfect magician and can do only the smallest experiments. Of navigation, which is a noble and heroical art, said the doctor, he was taught nothing because King Miraz disapproved of ships in the sea. He also learned a great deal by using his own eyes and ears. As a little boy, he had often wondered why he disliked his aunt, Queen Pruna Prismia. He now saw that it was because she disliked him. He also began to see that Narnia was an unhappy country. The taxes were high and the laws were stern and Miraz was a cruel man. After some years, there came a time when the queen seemed to be ill and there was a great deal of bustle and bother about her in the castle and doctors came and the courtiers whispered. This was an early summer time. And one night, while all this fuss was going on, Caspian was unexpectedly wakened by Dr. Cornelius after he had been only a few hours in bed. Are we going to do a little astronomy, doctor? said Caspian. Hush, said the doctor. Trust me and do exactly as I tell you. Put on your clothes. You have a long journey before you. Caspian was very surprised, but he had learned to have confidence in his tutor, and he began doing what he was told at once. When he was dressed, the doctor said, I have a wallet for you. We must go into the next room and fill it with victuals from your highness's supper table. My gentlemen in waiting will be there, said Caspian. They are fast asleep and will not wake, said the doctor. I am a very minor magician, but I can at least contrive a charmed sleep. They went into the antechamber, and there, sure enough, the two gentlemen in waiting were sprawling on chairs and snoring hard. Dr. Cornelius quickly cut up the remains of a cold chicken and some slices of venison, and put them, with bread and an apple or so and a little flask of good wine, into the wallet which he then gave to Caspian. It fitted on by a strap over Caspian's shoulder, like a satchel you would use for taking books to school. Have you your sword? asked the doctor. Yes, said Caspian. Then put this mantle over all to hide the sword and the wallet. That's right. And now we must go to the great tower and talk. When they had reached the top of the tower, it was a cloudy night, not at all like the night when they had seen the conjunction of Tarva and Ellenville. Dr. Cornelia said, Dear Prince, you must leave this castle at once and go to seek your fortune in the wide world. Your life is in danger here. Why? asked Caspian. Because you are the true king of Narnia, Caspian the Tenth, the true son and heir of Caspian the Ninth. Long life to your majesty. And suddenly, to Caspian's great surprise, the little man dropped down on one knee and kissed his hand. What does it all mean? I don't understand, said Caspian. I wonder you have never asked me before, said the doctor, why, being the son of King Caspian, you are not King Caspian yourself. Everyone except your majesty knows that Miraz is a usurper. When he first began to rule, he did not even pretend to be the king. He called himself Lord Protector. But then your royal mother died, the good queen, and the only Telmarine who was ever kind to me. And then, one by one, all the great lords who had known your father died or disappeared, not by accident either. Miraz weeded them out. Belisar and Uvalis were shot with arrows on a hunting party. By chance, it was pretended. All the great house of the Passerids he sent to fight giants on the northern frontier till one by one they fell. Arlian and Eremon and a dozen more he executed for treason on a false charge. The two brothers of Beaversdam 
he shut up his madmen. And finally he persuaded the seven noble lords, who alone among all the Telmarines did not fear the sea, to sail away and look for new lands beyond the eastern ocean. And as he intended, they never came back. And when there was no one left who could speak a word for you, then his flatterers, as he had instructed them, begged him to become king. And of course he did. Do you mean he now wants to kill me too? said Caspian. That is almost certain, said Dr. Cornelius. But why now? said Caspian. I mean, why didn't he do it long ago if he wanted to? And what harm have I done him? He has changed his mind about you because of something that happened only two hours ago. The queen has had a son. I don't see what that's got to do with it, said Caspian. Don't see, exclaimed the doctor. Have all my lessons in history and politics taught you no more than that? Listen, as long as he had no children of his own, he was willing enough that you should be king after he died. He may not have cared much about you, but he would rather you should have the throne than a stranger. Now that he has a son of his own, he will want his own son to be the next king. You are in the way. He'll clear you out of the way. Is he really as bad as that, said Caspian? Would he really murder me? He murdered your father, said Dr. Cornelius. Caspian felt very queer and said nothing. I can tell you the whole story, said the doctor, but not now. There is no time. You must fly at once. You'll come with me, said Caspian. I dare not, said the doctor. It would make your danger greater. Two are more easily tracked than one. Dear Prince, dear King Caspian, you must be very brave. You must go alone and at once. Try to get across the southern border to the court of King Nain of Arkenland. He will be good to you. Shall I never see you again? said Caspian in a quavering voice. I hope so, dear king, said the doctor. What friend have I in the wide world except your majesty? And I have a little magic. But in the meantime, speed is everything. Here are two gifts before you go. This is a little purse of gold. Alas, all the treasure in this castle should be your own by rights. And here is something far better. He put in Caspian's hands something which he could hardly see, but which he knew by the feel to be a horn. That, said Dr. Cornelius, is the greatest and most sacred treasure of Narnia. Many terrors I endured, many spells did I utter to find it when I was still young. It is the magic horn of Queen Susan herself, which she left behind her when she vanished from Narnia at the end of the Golden Age. It is said that whoever blows it shall have strange help. No one can say how strange. It may have power to call Queen Lucy and King Edmund and Queen Susan and the High King Peter back from the past, and they will set all to rights. It may be that it will call up Aslan himself. Take it, King T Caspian, but do not use it except at your greatest need. And now, haste, 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 the little door at the very bottom of the tower, the door into the garden, is unlocked. There we must part. Can't I get my horse Destrier? said Caspian. He is already saddled and waiting for you just at the corner of the orchard. During the long climb down the winding staircase, Cornelius whispered many more words of direction and advice. Caspian's heart was sinking, but he tried to take it all in. Then came the fresh air in the garden, a fervent hand clasp with the doctor, a rush acro across the lawn, a welcoming whinny from Destrier, and so King Caspian the Tenth left the castle of his fathers. Looking back, he saw fireworks going up to celebrate the birth of the new prince. All night he rode southward, choosing byways and bridle paths through woods as long as he was in the country that he knew, but afterwards he kept to the high road. Destrier was as excited as his master at this unusual journey, and Caspian, though tears had come into his eyes at saying goodbye to Dr. Cornelius, felt brave, and in a way happy, to think that he was King Caspian riding to seek adventures, with his sword on his left hip and Queen Susan's magic horn on his right. But when day came, with a sprinkle of rain, and he looked about him and saw on every side unknown woods, wild heaths, and blue mountains, he thought how large and strange the world was, and felt frightened and small. As soon as it was full daylight, he left the road and found an open, grassy place amid a wood where he could rest. He took off Destrier's bridle and let him graze, ate some cold chicken and drank a little wine, and presently fell asleep. It was late afternoon when he awoke. He ate a morsel and continued his journey, still southward, 
by many unfrequented lanes. He was now in a land of hills, going up and down, but always more up than down. From every ridge he could see the mountains growing bigger and blacker ahead. As the evening clo closed in, he was riding their lower slopes. The wind rose. Soon rain fell in torrents. Destrier became uneasy. There was thunder in the air. And now they entered a dark and seemingly endless pine forest. And all the stories Caspian had ever heard of trees being unfriendly to man crowded into his mind. He remembered that he was, after all, a Telmarine, one of the race who cut down trees wherever they could and were at war with all wild things. And though he himself might be unlike other Telmarines, the trees could not be expected to know this. Nor did they. The wind became a tempest. The woods roared and creaked all round him. There came a crash. A tree fell right across the road, just behind him. Quiet, Destrier, quiet, said Caspian, patting his horse's neck. But he was trembling himself and knew that he had escaped death by an inch. Lightning flashed, and a great crack of thunder seemed to break the sky in two just overhead. Destrier bolted in good earnest. Caspian was a good rider, but he had not the strength to hold him back. He kept his seat, but he knew that his life hung by a thread during the wild career that followed. Tree after tree rose up before them in the dusk and was only just avoided. Then, almost too suddenly to hurt, and yet it did hurt him too, something struck Caspian on the forehead, and he knew no more. When he came to himself, he was lying in a firelit place with bruised limbs and a bad headache. Low voices were speaking close at hand. And now, said one, before it wakes up, we must decide what to do with it. Kill it, said another. We can't let it live. It would betray us. We ought to have killed it at once, or else let it alone, said a third voice. We can't kill it now. Not after we've taken it in and bandaged its head and all. It would be murdering a guest. Gentlemen, said Caspian in a feeble voice, whatever you do to me, I hope you will be kind to my poor horse. Your horse had taken flight long before we found you, said the first voice, a curiously husky, earthy voice, as Caspian now noticed. Now don't let it talk you round with its pretty words, said the second voice. I still say, horns and halibuts, exclaimed the third voice. Of course we're not going to murder it. For shame, Nickabrick. What do you say, truffle hunter? What shall we do with it? I shall give it a drink, said the first voice, presumably truffle hunters. A dark shape approached the bed. Caspian felt an arm slipped gently under his shoulders. If it was exactly an arm, the shape somehow seemed wrong. The face that bent towards him seemed wrong, too. He got the impression that it was very hairy and very long-nosed, and there were odd white patches on each side of it. It's a mask of some sort, thought Caspian. Or perhaps I'm in a fever and imagining it all. A cup full of something sweet and hot was set to his lips, and he drank. At that moment, one of the others poked the fire. A blaze sprang up, and Caspian almost screamed with the shock as the sudden light revealed the face that was looking into his own. It was not a man's face, but a badger's, though larger and friendlier and more intelligent than the face of any badger he had seen before, and it had certainly been talking. He saw, too, that he was on a bed of heather in a cave. By the fire sat two little bearded men, so much wilder and shorter and hairier and thicker than Dr. Cornelius, that he knew them at once for real dwarfs, ancient dwarfs, with not a drop of human blood in their veins. And Caspian knew that he had found the old Narnians at last. Then his head began to swim again. In the next few days he learned to know them by names. The badger was called Truffle Hunter. He was the oldest and kindest of the three. The dwarf who had wanted to kill Caspian was a sour black dwarf. That is, his hair and beard were black, and thick and hard like horse hair. His name was Nickabrick. The other dwarf was a red dwarf with hair rather like a fox's, and he was called Trumpkin. Now, said Nickabrick on the first evening when Caspian was well enough to sit up and talk, we still have to decide what to do with this human. You two think you've done it a great kindness by not letting me kill it. But I suppose the upshot is that we have to keep it a prisoner for life. I'm certainly not going to let it go out alive to go back to its own kind and betray us all. Bulbs and bolsters, Nickabrick, said Trumpkin. Why need you talk so unhandsomely? It isn't the creature's fault that it bashed its head against a tree outside our hole, and I don't think it looks like a traitor. I say, said Caspian, 
You haven't yet found out whether I want to go back. I don't. I want to stay with you, if you'll let me. I've been looking for people like you all my life. That's a likely story, growled Nickabrick. You're a Telmarine and a human, aren't you? Of course you want to go back to your own kind. Well, even if I did, I couldn't, said Caspian. I was flying for my life when I had my accident. The king wants to kill me. If you'd kill me, you'd have done the very thing to please him. Well, now, said Truffle Hunter, you don't say so. Eh, said Trumpkin, what's that? What have you been doing, human, to fall foul of Miraz at your age? He's my uncle, began Caspian, when Nickabrick jumped up with his hand on his dagger. There you are, he cried, not only a Telmarine, but close kin and heir to our greatest enemy. Are you still mad enough to let this creature live? He would have stabbed Caspian then and there if the badger and Trumpkin had not got in the way and forced him back to his seat and held him down. Now once and for all, Nickabrick, said Trumpkin, will you contain yourself? Or must Truffle Hunter and I sit on your head? Nickabrick sulkily promised to behave, and the other two asked Caspian to tell his whole story. When he had done so, there was a moment's silence. This is the queerest thing I ever heard, said Trumpkin. I don't like it, said Nickabrick. I didn't know there were stories about us still told among the humans. The less they know about us, the better. That old nurse now, she'd better have held her tongue. And it's all mixed up with that tutor. The renegade dwarf. I hate them. I hate them worse than the humans. You mark my words. No good will come of it. Don't you go talking about things you don't understand, Nickabrick, said Truffle Hunter. You dwarfs are as forgetful and changeable as the humans themselves. I'm a beast, I am, and a badger, what's more. We don't change. We hold on. I say great good will come of it. This is the true king of Narnia we've got here. A true king. Coming back to true Narnia. And we beasts remember, even if dwarves forget, that Narnia was never right except when a son of Adam was king. Whistles and whirligigs, truffle hunter, said Trumpkin. You don't mean you want to give the country to humans. I said nothing about that, answered the badger. It's not men's country. Who should know that better than me? But it's a country for a man to be king of. We badgers have long enough memories to know that. Why, bless us all, wasn't the high king Peter a man? Do you believe all those old stories? asked Trumpkin. I tell you, we don't change, we beasts, said Truffle Hunter. We don't forget. I believe in the High King Peter and the rest that reigned at Care Paravel as firmly as I believe in Aslan himself. As firmly as that, I dare say, said Trumpkin. But who believes in Aslan nowadays? I do, said Caspian. And if I hadn't believed in him before, I would now. Back there among the humans, the people laughed at Aslan, would have laughed at stories about talking beasts and dwarfs. Sometimes I did wonder if there really was such a person as Aslan, but then sometimes I wondered if there were really people like you. Yet there you are. That's right, said Truffle Hunter. You're right, King Caspian. And as long as you will be true to old Narnia, you shall be my king, whatever they say. Long life to your majesty. You make me sick, Badger, growled Nickabrick. The High King Peter and the rest may have been men, but they were a different sort of men. This is one of the cursed Telmarines. He has hunted beasts for sport, haven't you now? He added, rounding suddenly on Caspian. Well, to tell you the truth, I have, said Caspian. But they weren't talking beasts. It's all the same thing, said Nickabrick. No, 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 said Truffle Hunter. You know it isn't. You know very well that the beasts in Narnia nowadays are different and are no more than the poor, dumb, witless creatures you'd find in Colomarin or Telmar. They're smaller, too. They're far more different from us than the half-dwarfs are from you. There was a great deal more talk, but it all ended with the agreement that Caspian should stay, and even the promise that as soon as he was able to go out, he should be taken to see what Trumpkin called the Others. For apparently, in these wild parts, all sorts of creatures from the old days of Narnia still lived on in hiding. Well, I hope you will join on Monday at noon for Father Patrick Can Read with me, Father Patrick, as we continue our adventure in Narnia by reading Chapter 6 of Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>